Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Warsaw Baptist Church. I am so glad to see so many people back. We've got vaccines and, and uh, everybody has got their masks if they need them. Every, it's, it's wonderful to see you here. Uh, I was, I, every time I turned around, I saw somebody else. I was like, praise God. Uh, if, you're, if you're brand new, uh, we, we have not had so many people in the church building for a while because of the COVID. So, so this is exciting. This is a wonderful thing to see. I know we've got a few more that uh, have gotten their vaccines, but they're not quite comfortable yet. So they'll be back soon. Uh, I just want to welcome you. I'm one of the pastors here at Warsaw Baptist Church. My name's Ken, um, and if you are new, we want to welcome you to our family. Uh, this church is a family of God, and, and you are welcome to be a part of that. Uh, if you are new, uh, please, please, by all means, let us know if there's any questions that you have after the service, if there's anything you hear that you have questions about or pushback. Uh, we love to hear feedback from you, so please let us know. We, we hope that you feel welcomed and comfortable here. Uh, if you are new or not, we encourage you to uh, invite people here. Uh, invite people. Uh, you can get on your phone right now and share the video if you're on Facebook, uh, and you can uh, get people here. I know a couple of our people are administrators, so it just shares on, on the page. But uh, but if you're not, then go ahead and, and uh, share this. If you're watching from home, go ahead and share this video. Uh, if you're watching the recording later on YouTube, you can just copy the link and share that. Um, we, we want to uh, make sure that as many people are, as possible uh, are able to experience the gospel. Um, so online is available for, for those who need it. In person is now preferable. So if you are able to, to be here in person, there there is just something different about being here. It's like, it's the difference between me giving a, a FaceTime call to my wife and actually being in the room with her. You know, it's, it's, there's just something about being with the family. So uh, we're so grateful to see you here. Uh, I'm pretty excited. I don't know if you can tell. Um, <laughs> this, this week, uh, this last week, we were praying for Refuge Bible Church. And uh, Refuge Bible Church is a church plant in Indianapolis that we are supporting. Each year, we have an Easter offering, and we have these little envelopes for the Easter offering. And typically, what we do is we, we collect donations for church planting in general across the United States. If you want to do that, you can still do it. Just make the check out to uh, Annie Armstrong. Um, Easter offering, or just put it in the memo line if you're making the check to us. But we're mainly uh, trying to raise money for this particular church plant, uh, Refuge Bible Church. Uh, we've watched videos uh, asking for different kinds of prayer this week. Uh, we had a prayer guide last week. There still should be some in your pews if you, if you uh, missed out on that. You can start praying this week. This can be your prayer week. It's not, it's not dated to just one week. Um, but next week is when we'll be taking those collections. Um, I'm guessing that like, like our regular tithes and offerings, most of you are giving online and we've had links every day uh, that we've had information about refuge to where you can give to them directly. We don't need credit for it. We don't, <laughs> like we don't, we don't want an attaboy or a pat on the back. We just want to get them funded and, and out there. Um, a brand new church is like a brand new business. It takes them about five years to really be on their feet. And uh, as we've talked about, their, their first year was... Uh, was impacted by, by the death of, of their son. So, um, so we're giving them an extra year, six years of support from our church, but we're ch hoping to at least match what we give as a church from our church families. So um, we have a couple families I know of that, that give a monthly offering to them already uh, in addition to their tithes and offerings here. So uh, that's a lot to say. Uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering is next week because next week is... Easter. Amen. Resurrection Sunday. I'm excited for that. Um, we have a Good Friday service here um, this, well, Good Friday at 7 p.m. And it's going to be a community uh, Good Friday service with us, Oakland Baptist, Warsaw United Methodist, and Gallatin Community Church. Um, so we're all going to be uh, sharing this uh, time, worshiping together. Uh, we have plenty of room in here and in the balconies for social distancing. Uh, I think we will live stream that as well, um, and we'll live stream it on our channel and then have links to the other churches. Um, but if you can, can be here, we would greatly encourage you to be here for the Good Friday service. We're going to have lots of, uh, of good preaching, little sermonettes. I'm not preaching. Actually, I'm just going to emcee it. 
because they want the sermons to be small. Um, <laughs> But we're going to have a lot of really great music, too, so, so come and be a part of that. That's this Friday at 7 p.m., um, and then we have an Easter service here at 11.30 a.m. Um, on Easter, and we're celebrating baptisms this uh, Easter. Uh, my Aunt May, raise your hand. And then Jessica Beach, who's not here today, and then Jake, raise your hand. And, uh, and we're going to... Yeah. It is, it is so exciting. Uh, we, we, we love to uh, fill that baptismal and, and dunk people as often as possible. Uh, so, so we're excited. Uh, this is a great time to be inviting people to church. Um, again, I, I'm a broken record, but people expect you to invite them to church. If you're a Christian, they expect you to invite them to church on Christmas and Easter. So uh, make sure you're availing yourselves of that opportunity. And, uh, and with baptisms, it's this beautiful picture of what we preach about the gospel, of dying to that old way of life and being raised into new life. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Um, we are not having a sunrise service this year. Um, in it, Last year we had to cancel for COVID, and since we can't do a breakfast, we're not going to do one this year. But... Oakland, Randall Beach is going to have, they're going to have a sunrise service at Oakland at 7.30 a.m. So if you, if you want to wake up early, I don't even think they'll care if you're in your PJs. Just get up, go. It's going to be a great time up there. Um, and then weather permitting, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt for our kiddos after the service and after the baptisms on Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday. And that's weather permitting. God willing, we'll get it done. Um, Wednesday nights, if you're new here, Wednesday nights we have a Bible study. Um, it's at 6 p.m., and right now we're going through the book of Galatians. It's a fantastic time. And I, I know last week I said, who's going to be there? And I had everybody say, we're going to be there. And then you weren't there. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so I'm not going to shame you, uh, but, but be here. Uh, on Wednesday, we're going to have a great time in the, in the Word, in Galatians. And uh, it's actually going to be... Pam and Doug's last service with us. So Pam, Doug, Heaven, and, and Sam are, are moving to Georgia next Thursday. So uh, we're, we're going to be praying for you. We've got churches for them to check out as soon as they get there. Um, I'm going to be calling them and bugging them. How was the church? How was the church? Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we're going to be, uh, if you're able, we're going to be helping them load up their U-Haul next Thursday. No, no, this Thursday. This Thursday at about noon. They live over in Owen County. If you don't know how to get there, you can just meet me here at about 11 a.m. and you can follow me out. Um, and we're going to get them loaded up and sent out with prayer. And uh, and it's going to be oh, it's going to be great. So uh, we're going to also have kids church today. Um, if you're new here, we have children's church for uh, from. First grade up to, I think, sixth grade, and it's, it's every second and fourth Sunday of the month. Um, we have nursery for kids up to kindergarten age every week, so uh, if you have any of those kids in those age groups, they're welcome to either stay here with you or uh, go to Kids Church and Nursery. Um, we also uh, would encourage you, uh, if you are new to Warsaw Baptist Church, uh, if you have uh, any questions that come up, if you're one of those people that's like, I, I don't know if I want to talk to you in person yet, I'm, I'm brand new, you can send us uh, a message. You can either call the office or you can email me. Uh, or you can just message us on Facebook. All of those messages and, and voicemails go right to my desk, so I will be in touch with you this week if you do have any of that. Um, if you want to serve with us, we have uh, many opportunities. There's lots of different things that we uh, have available for you to help serve. It can be uh, children's church. It can be sound and, and audio. It can be a uh, video booth. It can be all kinds of things, uh, just swinging a hammer. We, we can put you to work. We have a... a, a food pantry that we can uh, have you help with, um, but we want to get you connected and serving is one of those ways to connect. Last thing, um, if you noticed out there, uh, if you go in the lobby and just over to the side, um, we have a bunch of new books. Now there's there's these books that are more geared towards counseling different situations. I picked up one that says, When Trouble Shows Up, 
seeing God's transforming love. But we have, I think, 30 different titles for different things going on. So you got an angry kid, we've got a book. Uh, you, you've got, you've got uh, a problem uh, putting your phone down. There's a book for that. Uh, I, I had no idea, but, but we've, we've got all these now. Um, they're free uh, to, to you if you need them. Uh, please take them only if you need them. Um, but also there's these little books in front of those, and they're for new Christians or new to church people. Um, this one is, How Can I Love Church Members with Different Politics? I don't think we'd probably need that, right? But, but, uh, but, but it's available uh, if you have it. And there's also books for why should we be baptized? Why should we be members of the church? What if I don't feel like going to a church? Um, so if you need one of those books, they're free for you to take. Uh, they're just out on the table out there. So um, before we get into our worship time, we're going to uh, share some prayer requests. I just wrote a new one down on my phone. Lucille, Cody... Cody Moore, um, Lucille's grandson, has, they found two spots on his liver, um, and he is a cousin, I think, of Matthew First, a cousin, um, so um, Matthew is also still waiting to get the rest of his treatments done. Uh, so they're on our prayer list. Um, Nikki Riley uh, is, is really suffering. Um, he's in a lot of pain right now with his cancer, so please be in prayer for Nikki. Um, Chris King has had ups and downs. So uh, every time we get a new report, it's either really a lot better or really bad. So uh, until he's out of the hospital, we're just going to keep praying for God to, to, to touch him and, and help his nurses and doctors uh, to get him the best care that he can get. My Aunt Bonnie, uh, who lives in Virginia, is going to be having a pretty major surgery on her pelvic bone um, next month in April. Okay, April, May, yeah, so uh, it's going to take about two months to recover from, so be in prayer for my Aunt Bonnie. Uh, be in prayer for Wanda Owen. She has her surgery, I think, on the 8th. Um, for, for the cancer that she has in her lung. Um, and then finally, I, I just want to make sure we remember we've got to be praying for the lost loved ones that we have. We have, we have brothers and sisters. We have children. We have parents. We have neighbors. We have coworkers. We have all these people in our lives who we love, who we, who we want to see find the freedom that we found in Christ. So don't stop praying. We've seen, we've seen old folks come to Christ lately. So uh, it, they, it's never, not you, um, but it, it's never too late to come to Christ. So if there's somebody in your life that you're just saying, I just don't know if they're ever going to get it, don't stop praying. It really does work. So, so uh, we're going to go into to prayer, and then we'll talk about how we worship. Father God, uh, I pray that you'd be with each of these people that we just mentioned. Lord, I pray that you would be with each of the lost in our families that, that you know are on our hearts, Lord. Uh, even as I said that, I'm sure that they came to mind to some of the people in this room. So, Lord, be with each of them and give us gospel opportunities with them. Uh, and, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, enliven those gospel opportunities for your glory and their good. Lord, thank you for that. Amen. Now, we worship at Warsaw Baptist Church in three... Uh, elemental ways on Sunday morning. We worship in our giving, we worship in our singing, and we worship in the preaching and hearing of God's Word. If you're a visitor or new here, uh, the giving part, you don't have to worry about at all. We want to be a blessing to you. Uh, that The giving is what we as members and longtime visitors of Warsaw Baptist Church, we do that to keep the ministry going. Uh, we have giving boxes in the at the sanctuary doors. We also have online giving or mail giving uh, available. Um, but all also, we, we sing together. And if you're brand new to church, this might seem weird to you. Uh, when we get up and sing, we're actually singing not to uh, be part of a concert or anything like that. We're getting up to sing so that we can sing out and praise our God. Um, and I pray that you would uh, just be filled with a love for God as we're singing. Don't be afraid to sing loud. Um, we don't care if you have a good voice. Uh, we just want to hear voices singing out to God. So we're going to uh, do that, and then we'll get into the preaching of the sermon. Uh, let me pray for this whole service, and then we'll get going. Lord Jesus, our God and our King, you and you alone are worthy, God. You are worthy uh, to rule this world, to rule this church, to rule our hearts. 
you are worthy to rule my heart. Father, we confess our sins to you. We know that we would be, we would be without any hope if it were not for your mercy. We know that you would be right to judge us. You would be right to condemn us, and yet you love us instead. King Jesus, on this Palm Sunday, we admit that over and over again, we have allowed our, our lives, the distractions of our lives, other people in our lives, other desires in our lives, even our own will to, to, to try to take pl your place on the throne of our heart. So, Father God, as we come together, we know that even though Jesus is our king, we don't always worship him as king. Jesus, please forgive us of that. Holy Spirit, there is only one way that we could have ever seen Christ as king. There's only one way. Had you not given us life in the midst of our spiritual deadness, if you had not given us sight in the midst of our spiritual blindness, if you had not given us hearing in spite of our spiritual deafness, we would have no hope of seeing Jesus truly as king. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you've done. Triune God, you are worthy of all of our praise. You are worthy because you are our king. As we sing now, Lord, let the songs of our praise, together with every moment of our life lived for you, be a sacrifice that you see as pleasing and acceptable in your sight. I pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our King. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, let's sing.
We just sang praise to God. Amen. We just sang praise to God. Amen. <laughs> Hosanna means a shout of praise. And our God is so great, so worthy to be praised. And then this next song we'll be singing about just how worthy Jesus is and how great he is to be praised. I'm going to read uh, Revelations 5, 5 through 10. And it says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, 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 worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign the earth. And I just love how it says here, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Because he is our king, the almighty God of, of justice and all power. Yet he is also, in verse 6, the lamb standing as though it had been slain. And everyone Everyone here at the end, you know, they, they shout their praise singing, worthy are you, and he's worthy because he's both the lion and the lamb. Worthy are you, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. And he ransomed those people slain so that he could reign and have us, you know, reign with him. And it's, it's amazing. It's how amazing God is. And now we get to sing out our praise to him every day about him and all of his glory. Amen. So let's sing this next song. And every 
just got to sing a song about Jesus, our King. The King of glory, the King of strength, the King of majesty. He is the Lord of heaven. He is the Lord of everything. He is the Lord of earth. He is the Lord of you and me. Let's point our, our eyes to his word in Isaiah 6, 1 through 3. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Holy is our God. And as we sing this last song, let's behold our God and all of his greatness, all of his wonder, his majesty, and his sacrifice that he poured out for us on the cross, but also for his everlasting reign. trembled at his voice all creation rises to rejoice behold our God seated on his throne come let us endure him behold our King nothing
Amen. Amen. You're going to have a seat for a second. We're going to release the kids to Kids Church and Nursery in just a minute. Oh, my goodness. That was, that was a time of worship for me. I pray that it was a time of worship for you. Um, it is such a blessing uh, before I come up and preach the word uh, to just have my heart centered, to have all the distractions kind of pushed out. You know, we all come in here with stuff, uh, pastors included, and it's so good to just have all that sort of pushed out of my heart and, and have this just sort of fill everything up so that I can worship in the preaching. I pray that it's been uh, helpful for you as well. We're going to pray, pray for the teachers and nursery workers and all the kids. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for uh, the, the noise of children in this room. We thank you so much for the, 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 the cheers of praise after each song. Lord, uh, we are to come to you like children, uh, just full of joy, full of trust. And Lord, we thank you that we have them to teach us that. Lord, we thank you that we have volunteers who give of their time and their service to, uh, to help these young children in the, in the service. And Lord, we, we thank you that, that you are going to bless them in that time. But as the kids are released back to the families to go back home, I pray that you would remind us as their parents and grandparents and caretakers that our primary job in their life at this time is to steward them well, to to steward the time, to steward our words in a way that builds them up in the Lord, not in the ways of this world, not in the ways of, of, of past family cycles of sin, but you have created us to be in their lives, to to raise them up to new life in you, to disciple them, to make disciples of our children. So Lord, help us to do it well. I pray all these things and we pray all these things in Jesus' perfect name. Amen. All right, kids, you can go. And while they are going, if you could turn in your Bible to John chapter 12, John chapter 12. Seems like every week it takes a little longer to get the kids out. It's a, it's a blessing. John chapter 12. We're going to read verses 9 through 19. Once you're there, um, if you could go ahead and stand up. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there should be a hardback blue one near you in the pew. If you don't own a Bible, please see me after the service. And we've got paperback ones in there that we would love to uh, get a copy of the word into your hands. Um, But yeah, once you're there, please go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. If you're new to church, the reason we do this is just to sort of, again, get the distractions out of our minds, and this is a a way to do that, and it also just uh, shows reverence for the God who, who gave us his word. John chapter 12, verses 9 through 19 says this, When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Verse 11 says that's because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Verse 12 says the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Verse 16 says, His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he had called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see, that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this word. 
As we unpack this word, please help us to uh, zero in on what you would have for us. Lord, there are so many people listening, so many people witnessing this word, and you have a message for every individual situation, every individual heart. And Lord, this is a very practical passage. There is so much meat here that we can fill ourselves with. So Lord, push away anything in me that would get in the way of me expressing this to to your people. And please get anything out of the way for those who hear so that their heart can receive this word. And Lord, we're praying for people to be changed on the spot. Whether that's people who are not yet believers to be changed to Christians, to to be able to, to find faith in you and freedom in you. But also we're looking for life change on the spot for those of us who have been Christians for a time and sometimes find ourselves drifting back into old ways. Lord, help us, mature us, enliven us. Bring us closer to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. This is Palm Sunday. If you're not a Christian, or if you haven't been to church in a while, this is one of those traditional holidays that we recognize as a church Um, And most churches today will be reading this passage or a passage like it in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Uh, This passage is recorded in all four of the Gospels. Um, And this is the start of what we traditionally call Holy Week. It's It's a week where we celebrate and remember the triumphal entry all the way through resurrection. And Holy Week, if you, if you don't know much about it, um, on Palm Sunday, we, we recognize this triumphal entry that we call it. On, on Monday, we, we recognize the day that Jesus went in and cleansed the temple. Uh, that's a, a, an amazing story if you haven't read it. Uh, Jesus goes into the temple where it should be this place where people find uh, closeness with God. And the, the, the leaders had turned it into basically just a storefront where they could sell animals and usually exchange money in a way that was usury toward the uh, people who, who needed to exchange that money. And he flipped over tables and he made a belt of rope. And, uh, you know, I mean, if, if you only have Jesus in mind, you know, hugging a sheep or, you know, patting a kid on the head, you really need to read the story of him cleansing the temple. It's, it's incredible. Uh, but then on Tuesday, we, we remember Jesus' final teaching in the temple. Uh, This is when uh, the Pharisees came to him and said, whose authority are you doing this under? And he answered that and put them back on their feet. And then they said, well, who who should we show allegiance to? You know, should we pay Caesar his, his, his tax? And he shows us that, no, our allegiance is to God and money is just stuff. Give it to whoever's pictures on it. You're made in the image of God. Give yourself to God. This is where we uh, see the, the Pharisees try to, or the Sadducees try to trip them up about resurrection because the Sadducees, if you don't know, there's different religious leaders. There's the chief priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. And so on this final uh, day that Jesus is teaching in the temple, they're like, okay, so say old girl has a husband and he dies before they have a kid. And so then she marries his brother because in that System. That's how it worked. The, the brother would marry. But then he dies and they don't have a kid. And then he, the next one, and seven brothers marry this lady. None of them have a kid. They all die. When she gets to heaven, whose husband is she going to be? And again, he says, you guys just have no clue what you're talking about. First off, you don't believe in the resurrection, so I know you're trying to trip me up. And second off, marriage is just a picture of what's coming once we get to heaven, we won't, we won't need marriage. We'll be closer to our spouse that we have here on earth than we ever were on earth. And it's, it, it's, it's just a silly thing. And so he, over and over, in this last day of teaching, he was just, just knocking down all of their silly arguments. And then on Spy Wednesday is what we call it. Some people call it Holy Wednesday. I think Spy Wednesday sounds cooler. That's when, that's when Judas officially breaks with the crew and he goes and he 
sells out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And then on Monday, Thursday, that's the day that we celebrate the Last Supper. If, if you don't know the story, you've probably seen the picture of Jesus and all his disciples at a table. It's where he tells them, point blank, this is it. I'm about to die. But also in that upper room when they had the Last Supper, he also gave some of the most beautiful teaching and instruction in one of the most amazing prayers. He prayed to the Father on the behalf of not just the disciples who were going to be left after he was, was killed, but he prayed for every one of us. He said, I don't just pray for these, but I pray for every one of them who come to faith because of what they've heard. Amen? It's, it's this prayer for us, like he was thinking of you the night before he went to the cross. And, and he taught with words, but also with actions. He, he got down, even though he was the leader of this crew, he got down and, and washed the nastiness off of their feet. And he said, just as I've come not to be served, but to serve, I now send you out. And you do what you saw me do. You go and serve the world. A great lesson for those of us who are Christians. Our, our job is not to try to get domination over a nation, domination over a workplace. Our job is to go and serve and love like Jesus. But then on Monday, Thursday, also we celebrate one of the most gut-wrenching prayers we ever see in the Bible, where Jesus, knowing what is about to come, he goes to the garden and he prays. And it says he was in so much turmoil that he, he sweat drops of blood, saying, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. And yet, not my will, but yours. And then on Good Friday, we call it Good Friday. It might sound weird to you if you're not used to church stuff. Good Friday is the day that Jesus was killed. He was betrayed by Judas with a kiss. Judas comes up like he's his best friend, his brother in arms. He gives him a kiss. That's just what they did back then. And that was a signal to the guards. This is the one to arrest and they take Jesus, who, who, who stepped down out of glory for us, walked this life perfectly in our place because he knew that none of us could live perfectly. They took this Jesus who, who loved us beyond measure, and they stripped him, and they beat him, and they spit on him, and they pushed a crown of thorns on his head so hard that it, it, it dug into the flesh and bone of his skull. And they mocked him and they said, oh, king of the Jews, king of the Jews. See, we just read that they were saying, hail, king of Israel. A week later, they were going to say that as a mock. And then they put him on a cross. And not only had he had suffered all of that from us, from humans, but then also the father turned his face away. Because every sin that you and I have sinned was put on him at the cross. Every sin that you and I have committed against God, every bit of, of cosmic treason from the little white lie to the adultery to the murder, everything was put on Jesus, and the Father will not look at sin. So as he takes all the sin on him, the Father has to turn his eyes away. The first time in eternity that there was not complete unity between Father and Son. Anybody, anybody had those moments with your parent and you know something just got messed up because of something you did? And you just, you mourn it, and you're like, oh, how can I make this right? How can I fix this? Jesus didn't do anything. We did it. We broke that fellowship. But he took that for us, not his will, but the Father's will for us. And he died, and he was laid in that tomb. And the next day, we, we celebrate Holy Saturday. Some people call it Black Saturday, Dark Saturday. Because his disciples who had followed him for three years, all of a sudden, he was gone. And, and, and like we read, they didn't know what was going on until later, until after he came back. 
Like we know the Easter story. We know that Good Friday leads to Easter Sunday, but they didn't know. Saturday was, what do we do now? Like, are we marked men now because we followed him? Are we going to suffer the same fate as him? Do we just go back to what we did before? What, what, what just happened? And then on Easter Sunday, what we'll celebrate here at 1130 next week, we're going to celebrate the resurrection. We're going to celebrate the day that death was conquered forever. The day that death became, instead of a monster that we have to fear, instead it's a butler that opens the door into eternity for us, if we're in Christ. I look out on this room and I see people I love who have said goodbye to people they love who are in Christ. And and the only reason we have hope for a reunion is because of Resurrection Sunday. So this is this beautiful start to this holy week. And look how it starts. Verse verse 12 and 13. The next day the large crowd had come to the feast and heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. It starts with this celebration. Yes, King of Israel, you're here. Finally, you're here. We've been waiting hundreds and hundreds of years for the oppression to stop. You're here. Let me ask a question. They said Jesus was their king. Let me ask a question. Who is your king? Who's your king? Now, we're in church, so I'm guessing most of you will say Jesus. But maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe you are here and, you know, you walked with the church for a time, but then you kind of fell away. Maybe you uh, have not fallen away completely, but your love for him has fizzled. Maybe you're here and you're back. Because something, something you saw in another Christian, something that was going on in your life, something caused that last ember in the dying fire pit to reignite. No matter who you are, who is your king? Who is honestly your king? Don't just give me the Sunday school answer. Who is your king? And the reason I ask this is because whoever your king is, your true functional king, not just who you say is king, Whoever your king is will command your steps. You are subject to a sovereign. You are the subject of a king in your life. The question is not, do you have a king, but who is your king? I know that I'm talking here in Kentucky, in America. We don't have a monarchy, right? So some of you might say, I don't have a king. You might be like that poet, I forgot his name wrote Invictus, who says, I am the master of my own destiny. I'm the captain of my ship. I don't have a king, right? Maybe you you just, you're just wondering, why are we talking about this? Aren't aren't we just supposed to have some kids wave some palm branches and get out of here? I mean, does it have to be like this serious? (laughs) It does. Why? Because again, if, if you don't have the right king, you aren't going in the right direction. If you don't have the right king, then you're going to be a part of a kingdom that you do not want to be a part of. The only way we get the kingdom of heaven for eternity, starting now and into eternity, is if we have the true king, Jesus. And so here's the main reason I asked it in accordance with the, with the scripture. Some of the people in this scripture did not hail him as king, did they? The religious leaders did not say, King of Israel's here. I guess we can just step back. We don't need to be the religious leaders. King of Israel's here. We're done. Some of them did celebrate him, but as we're going to see, it was fickle. It was a fickle celebration of Jesus. I believe if we can put our finger on the problem here in John 12, 2,000 years ago, we can put the finger on the problem that some of us have in our life even today. 
So let's unpack this by looking at three groups. We're going to look at the religious leaders. We're going to look at the crowd. And we're going to look at the disciples. All right? Religious leaders, the crowd, and the disciples. If you're a note taker, I know that's how some of you say amen. Yes. Religious leaders, the crowd, and the disciples. First, let's look at the religious leaders. In verses 9 through 11, we see them. In verse 19, we see them. It says, When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests, these are the religious leaders, they made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Verse 19 says, so the Pharisees, these are another group of religious leaders, said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. So what's their problem? Why are they so upset to the point that they not only want to kill Jesus, they want to kill Lazarus? What's the problem? The problem is their king. So the question is, who is their king? I think to, to understand who their king is, you have to kind of step back. You ever been to a museum or like an art museum and there's like one of these huge paintings on the wall and you get really close and there's all this really neat detail. But you have to step back sometimes to see the whole picture. Otherwise, you don't know the context. You don't know what's going on here. Well, I think that's what we have to do when we, when we ask the question, who is the king that the Pharisees are, are bowing to? And, and you see it actually just in the chapter before. If you just go back to chapter 11, it's on the same page on my Bible, I don't know about yours. Chapter 11, and look at verses 45 through 48, we see who their king really is. It says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So this is right after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Dead man, in a tomb, alive. They went back to the Pharisees. They told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we going to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And listen, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Who's their king? Self. Their king is their power. They bow down to whatever gets them the power, whatever gets them the prestige, whatever keeps them in control. And this, this result, this, this self-kingship is so ugly that it results in them saying, you know what, this guy who he raised from the dead, remember his sisters were terribly upset. Imagine somebody that you love just died and Jesus raised them from the dead. You're over the moon, right? They say, we got to kill that guy because people are going to Jesus because he did this. They don't care about this guy. They don't care about his family. They don't care about the role that they have that they're trying to protect. Their role is to be the religious leaders. And yet, as the religious leaders, they are trampling the word of God that they say they love. They're plotting murder. That's in the top ten. Do not murder. It's all pushed out of the way because they're trying to hold on to their own rule. And it doesn't just go bad there. They go to full-on apostasy. If you, if you turn over to, to chapter 19, apostasy means turning away from the faith that you say you have. In chapter 19, I'll let you get there. I love that sound. Chapter 19, verse 12 and 15. Look at this. These are the religious leaders. Pilate says to the Jews, he says, behold your king. And they cried out, away with him, Jesus, away with him, crucify him. 
Pilate said to him, Shall I crucify your king? Now listen, the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. Now you might say, Well, it sounds like Caesar's their king. But no. Caesar is just who they will bow to so that they can keep what is really important in their heart, their rule in Jerusalem. They don't care about the rest of the world. They don't care about really Jerusalem. They just want to be in control. So they will just do whatever they need to do. They'll go along to get along as long as nobody messes with their power. Thank goodness we're not like them, right? Then there's the crowd, the mob. If anybody knows anything from watching the news in the last year, it's that mobs can change directions and change allegiance as quick as I'm snapping my finger. Individuals are smart. Groups of people sometimes incredibly stupid and destructive. Right? Let's look at this crowd, this mob. It all looks good in the passage that we read today. Verse 9 says, When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Sounds good. Verse 12 through 13, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Bless you. Verses 17 through 19. Again, sounds good. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. They're doing what I always call you to do. Go tell people about Jesus. They're doing that. And the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he'd done this sign. So everything seems good. But again, a mob can change directions quick. Now, now, as a pastor, I get into robust dialogue, not arguments, but robust dialogue with other Christians who like to argue things like, is this the exact same crowd that said, crucify him a week later? I used to say that all the time. I think some of them were in the same crowd. May not have been the same crowd. But I do know that it's not a stretch to think that they might change their mind that quick. I mean, that's kind of the story of humanity, right? Two chapters of greatness in Genesis 1 and 2, broken by Genesis 3. God delivers his people out of Egypt. Before they even cross the Red Sea, they're saying, did you just bring us out here to kill us? He gives them the the Ten Commandments. The first one is, do not worship any other gods. Do not make any graven images. Before Moses can even bring the tablets of the Ten Commandments down, they're worshiping a golden calf. It doesn't take long for groups to switch gears. And so I don't know what happened in the the week, but I do know that before we even get out of this chapter, the group seems to be changing their tune. Look at verses 32 through 37 in this same chapter. Same chapter. 32 through 37. I'm on the wrong page. Okay, there we go. It says... Jesus is telling the crowd, listen, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He did this to show them what kind of death that he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, we have, we've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the light does not know where, or the one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, listen, believe in the light that you may become the sons of light. And when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Listen, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. What does that mean? Weren't they the ones that were just shouting, the king of Israel, Hosanna, blessed is he. The king of Israel is here. Jesus says in the same chapter, they don't believe in me. 
What's the problem? Why, why are people, including us, because we're people, why are we so prone to switch gears like that? Who is their God? I would say that the God of these people is a Jesus-ish king. You know what I mean? So they, they understood when Jesus comes in, they understand that when the Messiah comes, it's going to be incredible. He's going to overtake all of our enemies. He's going to bring in this brand new world. He's going to flip everything upside down. It's going to be incredible. So they see him coming in. He's fulfilling prophecy from Zechariah. He's walking, riding in on a colt. They're like, he's our king. Rome is done. No more taxes, no more slavery, no more another nation because it was Rome after it was Persia, after it was all these other. We're done. The king's here. They understood some of the Bible and some of what the Bible said about the king, but they either ignored or were ignorant of the rest of the scripture that also said, this king is also going to be the suffering servant. He's, he's going to reign, but the way to the throne is through the cross. They had a, an idea of Jesus, but a lot of it was kind of mixed with their own earthly human desires for what, oh, I hope he's like this. So before we talk about the disciples, the third group, I just need to ask a question. Can you see yourself in any of these two, either of these two groups? Do you see yourself sometimes tending toward this king or that king? Do you sometimes find yourself bowing to king self or king Jesus-ish? Here's how you know if you, if you are. When things get uncomfortable for you, when it seems like somebody is taking control from you, when it feels like you are not in charge, in command, how do you react? D does, does, does your heart fill with rage when your throne is, is turned over? Let's be honest. I like how things are right now. What do I have to say to keep it going this way? I don't like things how they are right now, so what do I have to do to get it going my way? And when something gets in the way, rage happens. It can be your boss, it can be your kids, it can be your siblings. The weird thing about King's self is even your own self, you can hate yourself because you are getting in your own way. Anybody who suffers from depression or anxiety can raise their hand. I deal with that. I'm my own worst enemy. When, when King Self is on the throne, when King Ken is on the throne, when I screw something up, I'm like, oh, what's the matter with you? And rage happens. Would you betray all you say you stand for or believe in in order to stay in control? When your boss says, hey, I need you to do this, would you have the same reaction as the Pharisees? Okay, we have no king but Caesar. Just don't mess with my money. Just don't mess with my time. Just, just don't stop giving me a pat on the back and telling me I'm the best employee. What about, what about the crowd? Do you have a Jesus-ish king on the throne? And, and I ask this, have you been a Christian for a time, but you still just haven't gotten into the word enough to know all of what Jesus is? Or have you read the Bible and you say, you know what, I don't like this part. Rip that page out. I don't really understand that, so let's, let's cancel that. Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers, he had a Jeffersonian Bible where he took the New Testament and he basically just marked out, cut out every part of the scriptures that he didn't agree with. It was Jesus-ish, but it wasn't Jesus. 
Is there something in his word that you say, I'm just going to pick and choose like it's a buffet, and that's not my Jesus? Maybe you've heard people say this. Christians, people who claim Christ say, I know, but that's for everybody else. Or, you know, that was for back then. He doesn't really care now. Do you praise him when it suits you and then turn on him when you disagree? All right, I'm going to stop stepping on your toes. Let's look at the disciples. The disciples, we see them uh, very briefly in this passage. Look at verses uh, 12 through 16. We'll start in 12 through 14 here. Okay, so the next day the large crowd had come to the feast because they had heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter in Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Verse 16 says, the disciples didn't understand this. They didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, in other words, after he went to the cross, after he went to the tomb, after he raised again and he started teaching them all how this, all the scriptures pointed to him, then they understood. Then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So the disciples in verses 12 through 14, they're witnessing this amazing thing that's happening. Everybody, as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, finally seems to get it. For three years, it was hot and cold, you know? Sometimes they got it, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they'd have a big crowd, sometimes they'd all scatter. But finally, the disciples were like, after three years, it's finally sinking in. They're witnessing this. But John tells us, John is one of them. He's like, but, you know, we really didn't get it right away. (laughs) We're like, why do you want to ride in on a colt? Like, it's a donkey. Like, if you're the conquering king and you want to ride in as a conquering king, get a, get a, you know, a strong Clydesdale or something. I don't know what kind of horse they have over there. Get something more powerful to walk in or, or just walk in. They didn't understand it. He said, go get me a donkey so I can ride in. And they're also probably thinking, we've been told that if anybody sees you, they're supposed to tell the Pharisees so that they can arrest you. Are you sure you want the spotlight on you? So they're witnessing all this and they're probably like, Wow. But they're also like, ah, looking out for the enemy, right? But they're on board. They're with him. Three years, they're with him. But listen, in just a few days, one of them is going to sell him out, and the other 11 are going to run away. So what in the world happened? I think you just asked the same question. Who is their king? Who is their king? Is it Jesus? I think Judas, the one who sold him out, if you don't know the story, Judas Iscariot is the one who who sold him out and betrayed him with that kiss. Judas, Judas, I think, had the same king as the religious leaders. It was king self. He wanted what he wanted. We know this because on Holy Week, Jesus uh, has his feet anointed with this very expensive perfume And Judas says, wait, what are you doing? We could have sold that and given it to the poor. And the Bible tells us he didn't care about the poor. Really, he wanted some of that money. We could have sold it, and I could have given some away, but I'm pocketing some also. King self, king greed, king misunderstanding. Like, I've been following him for three years, and it looks like it's all going to go south real quick. I'm giving up. King self stepped in, and he had this murderous intention the other 11 i think they had fear you ever have king fear on the throne king fear will cause you to do stupid things king fear will cause you to do hateful things king fear will cause you to do nothing everybody been been paralyzed by king fear nothing i won't do anything because then maybe everything will be okay no the world's keeping on moving They have fear, but also I think they have a little bit of that crowd Jesus-ishness. Now, you might say, no, they're different from the crowd because they didn't scatter until this last minute. They walked with him through amazing things. Three years, they witnessed authoritative teaching that everyone who heard him teach said, he's different. 
I don't know what it is. Some, of, some people didn't understand what it was, but they said, Pharisees teach like people who are reading the book. He's teaching like the one who wrote it. He's teaching with authority, like he's the author. They saw all that. They saw miracle after miracle after miracle. Lazarus isn't the only one that he raised from the dead. Jesus raised the, 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 the widow's son in Maine. He also cast out demon after demon. He healed the sick. He, he turned blind eyes, literally blind eyes to be able to see. He took people who had been crippled and not able to walk for their whole life, and he touched them, and they jumped up. So, like, imagine that. You're sitting there, and these atrophied legs that have never held the weight of this body, all of a sudden they're muscular and able to, to leap. It's insane what they saw. And they stuck by him. If you just go back to chapter 6 real quick, real quick. This is why they don't let me preach on Good Friday. Chapter 6, verses 66 through 69. Look at this. This is lead, what happened right before this is Jesus had fit, fed thousands of people with two loaves of bread and a couple fish. And you know the story? Do you know? Do you, it's, it's a famous story. Like even non-Christians are like, oh yeah, I've heard of that story. So imagine he feeds all these people. Guess who's coming back the next day? Same people. But the problem is they had a bread king. They said, oh, he's feeding us. He'll be our king. But then he started teaching some stuff, and they're like, I'm checking out. Maybe that's you. Maybe, you. maybe you had been to church for a while, and you were really getting in good, and then you heard some teaching from the Bible, and you're like, you really believe that? I'm gone. I'm gone. That's what had just happened prior to this. After this, like, if you don't know the story, he had just told the people, you want physical bread. But if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Like, it's weird, it's weird teaching. And they say, we're done. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus, he turns to the 12, the 12, not the crowd, but the 12, the disciples, the ones who are there, thick and thin, they've seen everything. He says to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon, Simon Peter answered him, he always answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So in chapter 6, they're saying, I don't care if thousands of people leave you, which just happened. We're sticking by you. And yet, it's even more shocking because by the end of the story, they scatter. What in the world? Again, I think they had this idea that, that yes, he's been talking about this weird die and three days later, but, but he's, he's Jesus. We've seen him do all this. There's no way he's actually going to die. It's probably symbolic or something. People are always trying to like, convince you that the Bible's all symbols. None of it's real. No, he, he said, no, I'm really going to die. And when they finally saw that and they saw the truth of these guards coming and arresting him, they're like, okay, this is not what we thought. And they walked away. Which is a lesson to us. Without the Spirit, we're just as prone to walk away. The only reason we stay with Jesus is because the Spirit assures us and redeems us and has sealed us and will keep us. The only reason. The reason that you're with Jesus, if you're with Jesus, is not because you're better than the disciples. We are probably much worse than all the disciples. But the Spirit holds us here. So my final question as we kind of close, land the plane. Who is your king? Who is, who is your king? Again, not the Sunday school answer. Is your king the bread king? Like, if, if Jesus will just keep me healthy and wealthy, I'm on board. If I sow my seed into his kingdom and he just keeps giving me a fat bank account and a nice car... And no, no doctor's calls, then we're good. Or is he your conquering king? You have enemies and you're just saying, get them, God. And as long as you're in control, as long as you're in power, you're fine. But if he drops the ball, you're out. 
Is he your king who approves of and affirms your sin? This is, this is a big king in the Christian church today. This is the king that, that says, you know what? I know what I said for thousands of years, but you are a special snowflake, and I'm going to make an exception for you. I'm going to affirm that thing that I've said goes completely contrary to my design because you're you. You're, you're special. Is that your king? Is, is your king the money in the bank king? Is your king the approval of others king? I will do whatever I need to do just so people like me. That king will get you in a lot of trouble. Is your king self? Is Jesus your king? Is, is Jesus of the Bible your king? Not, not what you heard about once, but who you've studied, who you've gotten to know. Like this should be the most intimate relationship we have if we say we're Christians. We should know Jesus better than we know our spouse, husbands and wives. We should know Jesus better than we know our kids. We should know Jesus better than we know our parents. Is it the Jesus of the Bible that you love? And the reason I ask this, the reason I'm so passionate about this is because of what we sang earlier. One day, every knee will bow to King Jesus, the real Jesus. It says this first in Isaiah 45. It says, says that, that every knee will bow. And he says in that very passage, he says, so turn to me. Verse 22 of, of Isaiah 45, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth it has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. The reason I'm passionate about asking you to ask yourself Heart, who's king of you? Who's king of my heart? I want you to ask that. I want you to, 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 to study your life and, and look and see because one day, no matter what, you will bow your knee to him. But you will either bow your knee to him as savior king or judge. Holy Week is a week of celebration. That everything God said was true. But it's also a week of terror if you're not his. Because everything God said is true. Everything God said is true. So who is your king? And, and if it's Jesus, I think you're probably like me. He is king. But man, sometimes I throw him off the throne. He is king, but oh, sometimes, sometimes I put another little throne right up next to him. So how do we serve him the way he wants to be served? That's, that should be the question, right? Like if he is your king, what does that mean? Jesus didn't make it hard for us. He says, if you, if you have me as king, if you love me as king, not like, oh, no, he's king. But if you love him as king, all you have to do is keep his commandments. And you're like, oh, man. There's a lot of commandments. How do I do that? Well, look at the big 10. You can look at the 10 commandments. No other God, no graven images. Don't use his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath. Love, uh, honor your mom and dad, which by the way, kids, that changes over time. You always honor them. You don't always obey them after you're out of the house. Parents, you need to know this. Your kids are about to grow up and get out of the house. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Shouldn't be hard, right? Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. If you love him, keep those. As I say them, most of us are saying, oh, man. I had somebody tell me the other day, I've broken all but one. And I said, well, Jesus says, if you have angry in your heart you've murdered she's okay well i'm done sorry king jesus I, I i i couldn't even do that but he also says here's another way you can serve him in in matthew i'm not going to read it because we're over time matthew 25 34 through 40 jesus says on the last day the king is going to be there and he's going to say 
You who served me when I was hungry, you who clothed me when I was naked, you who visited me in prison. And, and we're going to say, when did we ever do that for you, King, Jesus? And he says, whenever you've done it for the least of these, you've done it for me. If you want to serve King Jesus, serve the least of these. The least of these are going to be different in your life than they are in my life. He's going to give you opportunities that I'll never know about and vice versa. Serve the least of these. But again, we look at that and we say, oh, man. I was in a hurry, and I saw this person who really needed help with their spare tire, and I was like, what do I know about cars? And I just kept driving. <laughs> I timed that. I was like, okay, at this time, I want you to rev it. So, so, so I just took off. I didn't serve the least of these, right? This... This is, this is not easy. Like, it should be easy, right? Jesus said, if you love me, if you come to me, I'll give you a light yoke to carry. And I see the Ten Commandments, and I, I see serving the least of these, and I'm saying, this doesn't seem light because I screw it up all the time. I don't remember a day of my Christian life where I haven't sinned somehow. Anybody? Do we have any perfect people? You're like, no, I didn't mean to raise my hand for perfect. No, none of us, right? See, that's why we celebrate Good Friday. That's why we celebrate Holy Week. Because we know that for Jesus to be on the throne of our heart, he had to go to the cross. The only way that we could be called his subjects instead of his enemies that will be cast into hell, the only reason is because he went to the cross. He was thrown and thrown there before he took his seat at the right hand of the Father. And so we look to the cross and we say, you are my king. I am a, I am a lousy subject. But you are so merciful, so mighty, so gracious, so loving, so patient. And every time I look to the cross, I see a picture of just how wicked my sin was, just how disgusting my sin was. But also I see just how loving you are. Oh, God. Oh, God, thank you. Is he your king? Do you love him? Will you serve him? Will you constantly go back to the cross as you bow to his throne? It's such a beautiful invitation. As we close, we're going to, we're going to just sing a song. It's in your hymnals. It's called Holy, Holy, Holy. I asked Ashley if she could sing this one, and she, I think, actually squealed with excitement because she loves the song. I, I, I think if you, if you think about the words as we sing it and think about what we just talked about, I, I don't know how you can not love it. So let's sing it and we'll pray and we'll go. If you want to use your hymnals, it's on page two, but we'll have the words up here too. And if you could stand with us if you're able. <laughs> Probably should start with that. Um. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty Early in the morning Our song shall
Amen. Amen. Father God, you are our king. Lord Jesus, you are enthroned at the right hand of the Father. Holy Spirit, you keep our eyes open to see the throne room. You keep our hearts enlivened to keep the faith in a broken world. You keep our legs moving and our mouths speaking so that others might know of the kingship that saves. Every other king on earth takes and takes and takes, takes land, takes soldiers, takes people, takes her time. But Jesus, you came and you gave everything. You gave us not just land, but the universe. You not only didn't take us away, but you gave us a family that is innumerable. You are so good. You are so worthy of our devotion. Lord, as we grow and go out, help us to go out as subjects of a king. Help us to go out so different than the world that others ask us about our king and give us words to speak the truth of your beauty. It's in Jesus' perfect and precious name that all God's people said. Amen. I love you guys. So glad to see you. Keep coming back.